Good morning, everyone. We want to thank you for everyone that have been joining all over the place. We don't know where you come from, but we're thankful to have you guys here in Zoom or even on Facebook. So just a little bit introductions about myself. My name is Loria, one of the therapists in Annan and still currently happily working in Annan. So just a reminder for all of you guys in Facebook and in Zoom, we're going to have this Q&A session where you can ask whatever questions that related to these topics to Candy, okay? So if you have any question that you want to ask her, you can just type in in the comment sections in Facebook or even in Zoom because we're going to collect that questions for her to answer. Now, before we really pass this time to her, I just want to introduce you guys to Candy Sim. She is actually a clinical dietitian in certified lifestyle medicines. In 2015, she graduated from Boston and 2018, she graduated in Loma Linda. So she trained in genetic research at Harvard Affiliated Hospital and Research Institute in Boston. Candy also received her training in medical nutrition in various hospitals and medical centers in Southern California. Now, she is working as clinical dietitian, designing and implementing health programs internationally. With her background in lifestyle medicine, she addresses the root cause of diseases using system-oriented approach and emphasizing on the importance of high quality nutrient food and phytonutrients diversity. What a privilege for all of us to hear this to today. Okay, so without much delay, I would like to pass this time to Candy. Thank you, Loria, for inviting me here. Um, just see a uh, quick corrections on uh, my previous schooling years. I actually graduated back in 2005. So I'm not as young as Loria has mentioned. Okay, so um, I'm very privileged and happy to share this uh, message with you today. And let me see if I can actually share my screen here. There you go. And we're gonna talk about nutrition during this pandemic. And uh, I'm sure many of you who are joining us right now have a uh, known someone who has suffered from this uh, virus, uh, whether it's our friends, our families, or our coworkers. So we're gonna talk about the importance of nutrition during this time um, of Earth history that we're facing and the importance of that. Um, let me see here, we're going to the next slide. Uh, there you go. So our gut health is actually very, very important in terms of uh, taking care of our immune system. Because as you can see here, two thirds of our immune tissues is actually located in our gut. And uh, about three fourths of our transmitter are located in our gut. So we need to really take care of this portion of our digestive health and making sure that this gut microbiome is in its healthiest condition to make sure that our immune system is also strong enough during this time frame. Um, so these are several functions of our gut flora. It breaks down the starches that we are eating, whether it's from carb um, or and or proteins that we are ingesting through our food that we're eating. It also produces nutrients such as vitamin K, B12, uh, and short chain fatty acids, which I will go into details of that in the upcoming slides. Our short chain fatty acids is very, very important uh, for our digestive health as well. And the absorption of minerals, especially magnesium, calcium, and iron. So the immune system, how is that related to our gut health? Certain cells in the lining of our gut spend their lives excreting massive quantities of antibodies into the gut. So we gotta make sure our gut is healthy. Uh, what happens when we have an unhealthy gut? It impairs our immune system. Again, uh, about two thirds of our immune tissues are located in our gut. And then that makes it more prone to infections, to allergies or to autoimmune conditions um, uh, that we, we may be encountering. So 
uh, unhealthy guts can also alter our brain function. There is a gut and brain connections here uh, when we look at the gut health. It actually uh, affects our sleep regulation, our mood and appetite regulations. And also unhealthy gut can increase inflammation is associated with that, which can also increase the risk of chronic diseases. And as you can see with the data that we are encountering these days, um, showing those who are most affected by COVID is actually those with underlying uh, causes of disease, whether it's uh, uh, long-term uh, diseases or short-term diseases, whether it's uh, immunocompromised conditions, uh, many, many different, um, different diseases, whether it's cancer or cardiovascular disease or diabetes uh, and so forth. So the more diverse our gut health uh, microbiome is, the healthier we are. So we wanted to enhance this diversity in our gut health. And uh, the amount of food that we're eating actually has an impact on the diversity of this gut microbiomes. So when we increase our caloric intake, um, it actually decreases the diversity of this microbiome in our gut. But when we opt for caloric restriction, now I'm not saying that we should be depriving ourselves from food on a regular basis, but when we cut down on our caloric intake, um, intermittently, uh, then it can increase the diversity of our gut microbiome, which can actually increase the health conditions of our gut. Malnutrition, on the other hand, so if we prolong this caloric restriction for a period of time, then it actually decreases the uh, diversity of our uh, gut microbiome. So you can think of it as a, a J or U-shaped curve. If there's too much calories, it decreases the diversity. And if we decrease the caloric intake slightly um, intermittently, then we can increase the diversity. But too long of caloric restriction leading to malnutrition can actually have the same effect as uh, the increased caloric intake. So too much food, too little food is actually not a good thing. We wanted to cut down our caloric intake intermittently. I'm, I'm gonna talk more about that um, in the upcoming slides. So looking at the slides here, Dr. Tang, uh, one of the researchers who will look at the gut microbiome uh, in his published data showing us that fiber, when we eat plant food that contains fiber, are those uh, nutrient component that is utilized by our microbes, those bacteria in our gut it actually acts like their food. You know, they, they thrive with this um, when we introduce fiber in our diet. And when this uh, gut microbiome obtain the nutrients, which is in the form of fiber or prebiotics, they produce this short chain fatty acids in different forms that will help us uh, with our gut health, whether it is improving the barrier of our guts. If you look at um, the inner lining of our gut, um, it is not a smooth surface. You think of it as a toothbrush. There's a lot of bristles on it called microvilli. And uh, sometimes these bristles can be separated and that's not a good thing. We want these bristles or this microvilli to be tightly um, uh, together, okay? Uh, joint together. So it improve these uh, barriers uh, when the, uh, the bacteria produce the short chain fatty acids and also modulate the blood pressure and it can decrease inflammation as well. So um, on the right hand side or your left hand side, I'm not sure if this is a reverse uh, on your end, you can see that there is a difference between a plant-based diet and an animal-based diet in terms of the productions of short chain fatty acids, which can in turn help with our health. So uh, the green bars right here are the plant-based intake, and then the red bars here are the animal's based intake. And there is actually a decrease of uh, short chain fatty acids productions when we're eating an animal-based food, 
which can in turn uh, also increase the inflammation in our body system. What they have noticed is there is this um, TA, TMAO is called trimethylamine N oxide, okay, TMAO. Uh, it's strongly correlated to the increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And uh, also higher levels in the blood uh, can lead to an outcome of two times the risk of heart attack, stroke, or death. Now, these are not good outcomes that we are uh, hoping to see, right? Uh, we, we actually want to prevent that from happening. Uh, but what happens is when we eat a lot of meat-based food or animal-based food, uh, this TMA is actually being oxidized by our liver to TMAO, uh, which when the increase in the amount in the blood can increase our risk for cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or chronic uh, kidney disease. So it affects our hearts and our uh, blood vessels and our kidneys. What about L-carnitine? Uh, this, this is the supplements that some athletes are muscles or they wanted to burn fats. Basically carnitine is a, you think of it as a school bus that transport the fats that we're eating into our cells to be burned into energy. And uh, too much of this L-carnitine which is actually coming from red meat consumption uh, supplements. It can also happen in um, gastric bypass because the food is directly um, uh, transported to the colon or in processed food or in some probiotics uh, that has high protein allowance can actually increase the productions of TMAO. Uh, but the opposite effects we are seeing is when a person decreases their caloric intake or practice intermittent fasting with two meals a day, uh, they actually see a decrease in the productions of TMAO. So the frequency of eating and the amount of food that we're eating is actually very important besides the type of food that we're going to be eating. So um, if you look at this plate right here, this is actually what we call an animal-based intake or diet, right? It's loaded with animal protein, whether it's in the form of meat or fish or uh, eggs, anything that comes from an animal-based food. And what they have noticed is, uh, I won't go into the details of ACE2 uh, upregulation, or, or, but basically, when ACE2, the angiotensins uh, converting enzyme 2, is upregulated, there is actually a protective effect um, on the virus. So we want this uh, to be upregulated and not downregulated. And what they have seen in the studies is uh, things that actually increase or upregulate uh, the ACE2 in, uh, receptors is the uh, resveratrol, the nutrient called resveratrol. And I'm gonna show you a list of that uh, food that contains resveratrol in just a bit. But I also wanted to mention that uh, when our dietary intake is high in fat, it actually downregulate this um, ACE2 uh, productions expression. Okay, so uh, these days, we're hearing the ketogenic diet for weight loss intention, and it is very high in fat, and sometimes more than 50% fats. And you can see on this picture right here is a combination of different kinds of fats, whether it's oil or the dairy products or eggs or meat um, or some nuts and seeds. But uh, nuts and seeds and avocados that are naturally high in fat in its natural states uh, comes with fiber. So remember, these fibers actually helps with our gut microbiome, whereas the animal-based product do not come with fiber. And oil in any form does not have any fiber either. So when we introduce anything that is a higher fat content, such as avocado or seeds or nuts, uh, we should combine it with a high uh, fiber food, which is actually found in 
lots of grains and beans. So eating whole grains and beans is very, very important. It's also found in vegetables and fruits as well. So what are the foods that are high in resveratrol um, grapes? Blueberries, bilberries. Now I know that these are food that is usually imported in Malaysia, uh, but we do have mulberries in Malaysia, right? And we do have jackfruit in Malaysia. So uh, resveratrol is actually found in this kind of food as well. So feel free to eat this kind of food on a regular basis. It can have a very protective effect. And on um, this slide simply show the amount of resveratrol in every 100 grams of these food listed. Okay. Um, zinc is actually uh, a very important nutrient and I'm sure many of you have come across uh, some uh, presentations or health talk from different providers mentioning the importance of zinc intake. But usually those messages are uh, conveyed by uh, supplements intake and we don't necessarily have to obtain it from supplements. It actually comes in whole food form as well. So zinc has an antiviral effect. It actually plays a very important role in homeostasis of the immune system. And a deficiency of zinc in our body system actually have shown to impair our immune system. So where do we find zinc? Uh, it is found in hemp seed, uh, pumpkin seeds, uh, garbanzo beans or chickpeas, lentils, cashews, spinach, avocados, and almonds. Uh, so these are the food sources uh, that has a very high zinc concentration in them. Arginine is also very important in terms of generating the nitric oxide by our macrophages. So it actually helps with our immune function. And you think of um, arginine found in uh, food sources that is very similar to zinc sources as well. So you don't have to memorize this type of food, basically opt for seeds and nuts and uh, ham seeds and things like that. It has very high source of zinc and then you can find arginine in nuts and seeds as well. So what some studies have shown is that the deficiency in arginine is actually correlated uh, or is found in the condition listed here, whether it's um, cancer or trauma, or liver necrosis and so forth. So your green leafy vegetables, uh, which also have fiber in them, it has a good source of arginine in them. Spinach has a good source of zinc in them. So uh, these are good food to eat on a regular basis. So eating lots of green leafy vegetables. We're not limited to kale or spinach. There are lots of green leafy vegetables found in Southeast Asia that we don't usually see in the Western countries. So take the privilege uh, of eating that type of food on a regular basis. Half of your plate should be packed with vegetables at all time when you're eating, whether it's the first meal or the second meal of the day. Um, now that may sound a little odd, eating vegetables in the morning for some of you, uh, but it's actually, it's very protective uh, for our immune function when we eat that kind of food on a regular basis. And uh, beans is very important as well. Um, not to forget that seaweed also contains arginine. So when you look at your plate, it should be colorful, it should be packed with different kinds of nutrients, and it should be food out of the ground, which is the original type of food that God has created for us um, to consume on a regular basis. Uh, so going back to our gut health, you know, again, the majority of our immune system is found in the gut and it actually helps with the productions of IgA1, uh, the antigens in our body system. And uh, it actually uh, comes uh, helpful when we consume a lot of fiber in our diet. So fiber is only found in plant-based food. We can't find any fiber in animal-based food at all. So eating lots of food that comes out of the ground. Basically, you look at the food on your plate and you ask yourself, is that something that I can get it from the garden? Okay, so um, if the answer is yes, most likely it's safe to eat. Uh, but, you know, these are living food as well. You know, you, you drop the seeds on the ground and start growing into uh, food again. But if you drop a piece of chicken on the ground, we won't get more chicken from it, right? 
So because those, those are dead food. So our living cells actually need living food and uh, these fibers are very important for our gut health. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip over this because of the time um, and mention that when we are um, attacked by this micro, uh, uh, I shouldn't say microbiomes, but these virus or uh, bacteria or any uh, uh, micro, uh, uh, what's the term that is escaping my microorganism that we are exposed to, uh, our body uh, become an inflamed mode, okay? There is a lot of inflammation that is going on in our body system. And this is the prime time we need to stay away from pro-inflammatory food, which again is coming from processed food and animal-based consumption. So the more we eat processed meat or refined food, uh, such as fried food or sugary food or add food with added fats or added sugar in them, um, it actually causes more inflammations to take place in our body system. So this is actually the prime time to avoid all of the food that promotes inflammation. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is getting uh, the vitamin D uh, is very important. So the best source of vitamin D is actually from the sunlight that we're exposed to. So um, get outdoors, get the fresh air, uh, get the sunlight uh, that we need. So spend time in nature. Uh, I know in the city is a little bit more challenging, but if you're out of the city in the rural areas, uh, get out in the sun, get the fresh air as needed, uh, go out, spend time in, the, in nature and get your vitamin D at the same time. Um, lastly, I wanted to mention about melatonin. Melatonin is actually uh, an anti-inflammatory hormones. Okay, it actually reduces the inflammation in our body system. It's also antioxidative. So it reduces the oxidations in our cells as well. So um, it has been found to be very beneficial to some COVID patients too in some of the studies. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and mention that sleep is very important in terms of the productions of melatonin. And so, um, sleeping early at night, not too late. So you don't want to go to bed past midnight. Um, that can actually uh, suppress our immune system when we don't produce enough melatonin in our body system. So sleeping well at night, uh, getting the seven hours of sleep each night and going to bed early, ideally by 10 o'clock each night would be great. And reducing the artificial light when we are about to sleep. When we are exposed to this artificial light, uh, the productions of melatonin actually decrease in our body system. And the other thing that actually decreases the productions of melatonin is caffeine. Um, when we're intaking caffeine, whether it's in a coffee form or chocolate or anything that contains caffeine, um, energy boosted drinks, um, it can actually decrease our sleep time by two hours. And it may take more than an hour for us to actually fall asleep. Um, from the, the time that we are going to bed. And it also increased the awakening times during the night as well. So caffeine is actually uh, what we call a hormones disruptors because it decreased the, uh, the productions of melatonin when we are sleeping. And it also decreased the, uh, the amount of stage three and stage four of our sleep cycle, which is actually crucial and very important in terms of healing uh, when we are sleeping. So when those stages are decreased, then it actually decrease the um, time frame of healing when we are sleeping. So avoiding caffeine is very, very important during this time frame. And uh, I usually mention this, most diseases begin in the kitchen. So the food that we are ingesting into our body system has a huge impact on how our body responds to the pandemic that is going on right now. So the type of food, the timing of the food is very important. And I wanted to leave you with this message as well. Um, the spirit of fear is never from the God that created this body. In fact, God has actually given us the advice in Isaiah 41 verse 10, mentioning fear not for I am with you, all right? God is with you all at all time. And, and 
and we shouldn't be fearful if we're doing the right thing to our body system and be not dismayed for he is our God. And he went on and say, I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you and I will uphold you in my righteous right hand. So that is a great promise that we have from the creator of this body uh, while we're facing this pandemic. So that concludes our sessions uh, or, or the presentation this morning, but I'm open for um, any questions that may come in. Thank you. Uh, I actually see few questions here. There's actually quite a lot. <laughs> so this, uh, let me go one by one. Yeah. So first questions is that in decreasing caloric intake for improvement of diversity, how much should we decrease the calorie and maintain for how long? Right. Okay. Uh, I'll give you an example of some of the health programs that I have been running. Uh, with some of our patients here is uh, when we go for caloric reductions, it does not mean that we go on to deprive ourselves and feeling hunger. So I don't want to uh, relate caloric reductions with fasting per se, okay? So um, when you look at processed food and animal products, they are generally higher in calories compared to high fibrous food they are usually low in caloric intake. So when we reduce a caloric intake, which means increasing the fibrous food, we don't necessarily have to go through that hunger pain. A lot of our, our patients who are in these health programs that we are running, uh, they actually do not feel hungry when they are on this caloric restriction diet. So basically you wanted to look at your plate and make sure 50% of what you're eating is vegetables. 25% would be the beans, and the remaining 25% would be whole grains or starch vegetables. And practicing mindful eating, chew the food really well before you swallow. And also at the same time, ask yourself within about 10, 15 minutes of eating, if you're still hungry. If you're not hungry anymore, you can stop eating. And that is actually one of the way to practice caloric restriction. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, we really need to tell ourselves, eat enough, not eat, you know, too full. Okay, another question from <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> from Facebook is that it says, how do we find a balance between getting too paranoid and calculate the amounts of micronutrients we need and having a healthy, well-balanced diet? Do, do I need to it's repeat? Very good. Hmm? I, I got it. Uh, so basically, we wanted to make sure that, again, the plate is half of it, 50% of what you eat is vegetables, 25% uh, is uh, the different kinds of green, uh, I should say beans, not greens, uh, beans or a legume source, uh, nuts and seeds fall into that category, sprouts as well, lentils and then the remaining 25% whole grains or starch vegetables. And then you wanna make sure you're not eating the same type of food every single day. So switch it around um, every two to three days, uh, diff different kinds of vegetables, different kinds of beans, and look at the color of the plate. If it is a monotone, it's an indicator there's not enough antioxidants on that plate. The more colorful our plates looks, the higher the antioxidants in there, which means the higher the micronutrients in there as well, whether it's vitamins or minerals that our body requires. Well, her answer is actually very, very easy to follow. She says that if you see colorful, that means you know it's balanced. So the variety is there is that we need to ask our questions. So the next question um, is fermented food, example, sourdough bread, bad for God? I hear conflicting views on this by Jenny. Um, so when we look at the gut bacteria, right, we wanted to make sure that there is a diversity of them, the, the different kinds of gut bacteria, and we want to make sure there are good bacteria in there as well. So how do we make sure the amount of bacteria, the diversity of good bacteria is there, is to make sure that these bacteria are well fed. 
And when they're well fed, they can multiply. So we don't necessarily have to go for probiotics, which is the fermented food found in uh, different sources. We can actually feed the bacteria and allow it to multiply and to increase um, in quantities as well. So eating uh, a food that is high in fiber source is really the key. Now, of course, there are some health benefits with probiotics, but we have to be very careful when we opt for that uh, in terms of sourdough, which is usually made with white flour, right? And so white flour, like all the other processed food, is actually food that actually will pull off nutrients from our cells, from our body, and make us deficient in the micronutrients that our body requires. And if you look at yogurt, for example, which is usually made in uh, a dairy form that's high in fat. And uh, the way that they preserve the amount of bacteria in that yogurt is to add in more sweeteners. The more sweeteners they input in there, the faster the bacteria will grow. And so uh, to preserve those bacteria in there as well. So sugar, as I mentioned, uh, will suppress our immune system. So we don't want that. And high fat food will actually has an impact on our immune system as well. Right. That just reminds me of her lecture just now where it says that fiber can also, can always, we can always get fiber from our whole grain. So I believe that if it is white flour, that's definitely not the whole grain. <laughs> so the third question, I mean, sorry, fourth question for today is there, is there a, an upper limit of meat if you want to maintain healthy gut? Is there an upper limit of meat intake? Yes, I think what is the limitations if I want if I still want to eat meat, what is the limitations if I still want to eat meat but at the same time maintaining the healthy gut? I think that's the question. <laughs> I see, I see. And I, I totally understand that it's not easy to opt for a complete 100% plant-based diet all at once, but I would advise that that should be our goal um, to, to aim for. Uh, during this time frame, so that we are not prone to any sort of attack um, from this microorganism out there. So I don't have a direct answer to that, but I would say opt for plant-based diet uh, the best we can. And if you do eat meat on a regular basis, try uh, going for a day or two every week without it, and you'd be surprised that your taste bud is going to change. Now, I would also add in another challenge, go for one week without it. I will assure you the first three days is going to be the toughest time. And you may even question, why did you get yourself into this? Um, but after the third day, it will get better. You know, you feel much better. Your energy so, uh, will will come back and you will have that energy to continue on with the daily routine and you will feel actually much better. And what we've seen with our patients who have done through our pro gone through our program is that they actually do not need to depend on caffeine to feel uh, awake, to get the energy that they, they need when they get off from their animal-based diet. I like the challenge by her just now, one week without meat. And also there's a warning there, three days, we're gonna suffer, but after that, we'll see the difference. We're gonna take this challenge, everyone. Okay, so next question, does taking melatonin supplements really helpful if we have problems sleeping? Now, this is talking about supplements here. Yeah, so I would say if an individual have a hard time sleeping at night, you wanted to get exposed to natural blue lights, uh, which is coming from the sun, uh, right at the evening time before you go to bed. Excuse me for a second. My, my computer is running out of battery. Um, so basically the sunlight that we're exposed to uh, around four or five in the evening uh, actually helps with the productions of melatonin uh, when we're about to go to sleep. So sunlight exposure is very important. And the other thing is to make sure that we are drinking sufficient amount of water on a regular basis during the day. And I usually mention at least 
eight ounces of water every hour in between meals and minimize our water intake while we're eating, um, which helps with absorption and digestion of the food that we're eating. Uh, so water intake and sunlight exposure, exercise in the morning, not in the late afternoon, actually within the morning would actually help to uh, improve our sleep schedule. All right, thank you for that practical answer, actually. Now we have a lot of questions need to go through. I'm going to take from the Facebook now. It says here, because if our current situations, which is the pandemic, doctors recommending us to boost our immunity by taking vitamin D, vitamin C, and zinc. What are your thoughts about synthetic medications, vitamins, and supplements? Uh, there is not much of a harm taking those, but I would say when we opted from a whole food source, as you can see in the slides that I've just shown, is that when we, for example, are for zinc source from uh, our green leafy vegetables, we're also taking in arginine at the same time. We're also taking in fiber at the same time. There's this synergistic effect when we're eating whole food that not we don't necessarily find them in a supplement form. So opting for whole food, plant-based, is really the key to upregulate the immune function and make sure that our immune function is working well and responding well. Yep. Um, another comment is that why opt for something that's not really natural if we have a free sources on that, right? So next questions would be, um, is there any food that we can consume to increase melatonin? Mm. Yes, yes, they are. Uh, a good source of uh, natural form of melatonin is found in nuts. So walnuts uh, and pistachios. And you can also find them in berries such as goji berries. Right? It's a good source of melatonin. Um, and some other kinds of berries as well. Uh, so eating those kind of food, uh, especially at the last meal, not too much though, we don't wanna have too much of a caloric intake at the last meal would actually help with the productions of melatonin. Next question, actually you already touched this a little bit just now, it's about the probiotic, but this person specifically asks, is taking probiotics good? Yeah, so I would not answer it directly as if it's good or bad, but to take a look at the form of probiotics that we are eating. So if we are eating the probiotics in the dairy form, then of course it's uh, packed with animal fats and cholesterol as well. Um, and you may wonder what if I just take the non-dairy source. Now the non-dairy source may not necessarily come with fiber. So we're gonna make sure that the food that we're eating has fiber as well. So um, like I said, uh, it's best to feed the bacteria than to put in the bacteria in our gut. Okay, next questions would be, <laughs> are zinc supplements good? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, uh, zinc supplements uh, is not necessarily the best source uh, to obtain. However, of course, if a person's zinc uh, is zinc deficient, they can take the zinc supplements. You wanna be, be careful with zinc supplements code because we can overdose with that. And um, too much of a zinc in our body system is actually not good. And the, the blessings of eating whole fruit is that our body actually know when to stop absorbing the nutrients. If there's an, enough zinc in our body system and we eat the, the rich whole fruit source of zinc, our body will stop absorbing them. But if we take it in the supplement form, our body will um, uncontrollably as keep absorbing all these uh, micronutrients in the supplements form because it doesn't recognize it as like the uh, whole food form. Go for natural, everyone. Go for natural. <laughs> all right. The next question. Is it okay to have raw salad and cook veggies and beans together? Absolutely, absolutely. And it's actually um, very important that we have some sort of raw vegetables in combinations of the cooked vegetables because the raw vegetables has natural enzyme in them, um, which helps with the absorption of our nutrients in our body system. So 
um, I'll, I'll give you an example. If you were to cook some soup at home that has a lot of beans in there and then lots of vegetables in there, I usually put in the uh, vegetables that can be uh, eaten raw last. You know, just just add that last so that or right before you're about to eat. Like for example, bell peppers. We can eat bell peppers very uh, easily in a raw form, or um, onions or garlic and things like that. Uh, not, nothing wrong with cooked bell peppers, but just to add in those raw vegetables right before we eat actually will help uh, with the amount of enzyme that's found in the raw form. Wow, thank you for the short, small recipe, actually. Now, this question from Tan Yok Fo, I am underweight. How much calories should I take per day and from which categories? My weight is 34 kg plus. I'm 5 feet 2 inch. Okay. That, oh. All right. So um, when a person is underweight, uh, we actually don't go for caloric count, okay? And the reason for that is it's very hard to focus on caloric count. It makes um, eating very cumbersome. So the key is to eat, uh, again, the full plate uh, that I have mentioned, half of the plate vegetables and uh, beans and whole grains and try to eliminate processed food. Um, the more processed food we eat, uh, the, the less of those uh, crucial essential nutrients that we are obtaining, which means it uh, compromises the function of our organs. When your organs is not working very well, it's very hard to absorb those nutrients. It's very hard to gain the weight that we need to gain. So um, making sure that the cells, the organs in our body are uh, functioning optimally we got to put in the right type of nutrients. And when we introduce the high diversity of nutrients in our food intake, meaning lots of color, lots of fiber, um, then we allow these organs to heal and we act, can actually enhance the absorptions of nutrients and eventually a person can gain weight. Yeah, a few more questions, <laughs> new one. Here it says, recently I have abnormal burp after meal. Is there any issue on my diet? Okay, so sometimes uh, a person may suffer from acid reflux when they are eating and uh, it can cause by different, um, uh, different factors. Uh, one of the reasons is the, um, the sphincter uh, right above our stomach is actually uh, quite relaxed and allowing the acid to uh, go in the opposite directions. And the reason the sphincter are, are quite relaxed is one, um, our intake has been very high in sugary food and or uh, high fat food. So when, once we eliminate that kind of food out of our diet, then the sphincter will not be as relaxed and would not allow this acid to um, go in in the upward directions. So um, acid reflux can be easily addressed by um, avoiding sugary food and high fat food. Okay, so I think Loria, you're on mute. I can't hear you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The next questions would be, I have been eating vegetarian for years and found myself low ferritin. How can I increase ferritin level in the body? Okay. And you can see uh, from uh, the first few slides that I mentioned earlier, as the gut microbiome actually help with the absorptions of iron. And so when we have a healthy gut microbiome, then it's much easier for our body to absorb uh, iron in the whole food form. So again, eating lots of fiber um, containing food is very important to heal the gut and to enhance the absorptions of iron. Um, so I hope that answered that question in terms of ferritin level being low. So by boosting the um, gut microbiome, in its healthy form and uh, the absorptions of iron will be uh, slowly taking place. 
Now this is related to places now because the question goes like this. Nuts are rather expensive locally. Can you recommend the few that are the best to strengthen our immune system? All right, so I understand that nuts can be quite expensive and quite limited in sources, but I'm sure that there are lots of seeds that are less expensive, such as pumpkin seeds and uh, sesame seeds and um, sunflower seeds. Okay, so again, pumpkin seeds is very good source of zinc as well. And so eating those kind of uh, food. Now we don't have to have a cup of that every day. Um, just, you know, a, a few tablespoons of that is fine to sprinkle on the food that we're eating on a regular basis. And uh, just a quick tips, you know, when you do a stir fry veggie, now when I mention stir fry veggie is water stir fry, right? You can actually saute onions and veggies with water. And after cooking it, you can add some goji berries in there. You can add in some sesame seeds in there. And this is also commonly found in Asian food. So um, good source of fiber, good source of micronutrients. All right, thank you. Um, this would be the second last question that I gathered. It says, oh no, sorry, last question. <laughs> is olive okay. oil good? Um, Olive oil, usually when we, by the time we find it in the store, um, they're most likely gonna be oxidized oil. They don't uh, last very long. So that source of olive oil is actually um, just right when it squeezes out the olive, uh, the oil from the olives, right? But we don't usually see that in the store. Um, in small quantity is fine, but to cook with it, it tends to oxidize very quickly under heat as well. Um, so a lot of people are using it for salad dressings, um, but you can actually make salad dressings without oil. Uh, so limit the intake of oil in any form is very helpful uh, with the uh, upregulations of the ACE2 um, um, uh, pr production. So uh, it actually will help uh, also to fight with this virus. So reducing fat intake. Okay, the moment I said last questions, two questions up. Okay, so we have around, around 10 minutes to go through with all the questions. So if you guys have any questions, quickly write it down. Uh, yeah, like this now. now. So I'm gonna go on with the next questions, all right? So I'm in the sun doing my gardening every day, but my vitamin D level is 23. Even though I was taking 2,000 unit of vitamin D supplements and my B12 is also low, although I'm taking Neurobion. Okay. Um, B12 is actually produced by our gut microbiomes as well. So again, addressing the health of our gut uh, bacteria is very important. Um, when our vitamin D12 D is low, uh, actually it has to do with the organs of our body. The liver and the kidneys are the ones that produce the vitamin D. We, we don't actually get the actual uh, function uh, vitamins that is, is bio available to our body system right away from the sun. Your organs have to convert these um, into the vitamin D that our body can utilize. And that is usually produced by uh, our kidney and our liver. And if these two organs are not uh, in its optimal uh, function, uh, then the vitamin D productions may be low. So how do we make sure that the uh, kidney and the liver is well uh, functioning? Uh, first of all, we got to drink enough water. If we are dehydrated at all time, it actually decreases the functions of our kidney. And if we are intaking a lot of processed food and high fat food, it decreases the function of our liver. So again, it's actually going back to eating whole food, low fat and no animal products and no processed food to allow our organs to function optimally. And uh, just to go back to that question, that's precisely why we're seeing uh, vitamin D level low in diabetic patients because their uh, liver and kidney functions are not in the optimal phase. And there are certain medications that actually lower the pro productions of vitamin D as well. 
So addressing the root cause of the problem is really the key. And maybe we can have another session talking about that later on. <laughs> All right. So everyone, oh, sorry, this, this question's coming up. I'm not certain how safe our veggies and fruits, even though it's labeled organic. I love to consume raw veggies. Do you think it is safe to soak my veggies and fruits in baking soda, vinegar, or salt solutions? Studies have actually shown that um, uh, just soaking in salt is actually better uh, than the other two that have just been mentioned. So uh, using salt water, don't, you don't want to salt your uh, vegetables and fruit uh, for a long period because the nutrient can leach out uh, from the fruits and vegetables itself. So again, soaking it in, in salt water for a short period of time, uh, I would say less than a minute uh, would be good. All right, um, wait, wait. can one replace eating of beans with tofu? All right, so <laughs> I, I, as I mentioned before, the more colorful, colorful our food is on our plate, the higher the antioxidants level. And so by just replacing the beans intake with tofu, we are not introducing the antioxidants that our body requires. There's so many different kinds of beans and different colors, whether it's red beans or black beans or garbanzo beans or kidney beans, uh, you name it, long beans, wing beans, right? different kinds of beans uh, that is available to us. And if we eliminate those and replace it with tofu, we don't get the antioxidants, the micronutrients that our body requires. Right, I almost skipped this questions, but this sounds like what should I do if I am already having high fiber food, but still low in ferritin level? Still on uh, ferritin yeah. level. Then we need to make sure uh, the kidney is working well, uh, the liver is working well. A digestive tract is working well. So that may be some underlying conditions that uh, the physicians can uh, take a look at and see what is actually leading to this problem. So a discussions with uh, physicians, a doctor, or anyone that is professional is needed as well in this area. So going... That is more of an individualized because it, it may be some underlying cause that we are not aware of. Um, some people may have uh, some chronic conditions that uh, may not be addressed during the sessions. So it's best to consult the physicians. All right. Um, we're going to go through very fast also now. <laughs> Which oil is the best for Asian cooking like stir fry? Water. <laughs> water. <laughs> All right. I know oil is red water. <laughs> so try that first. Water. If you guys really cannot make it, come back to us again. All right. Moving on. <clears throat> Where am I now? Uh, can eating too much nuts and bean cause gout and increase uric acid? Uh, it's a very good question. You know, I have a very dear friend who has been doing this research in Taiwan, um, looking at the correlations of beans intake and gout. Uh, what we're seeing is those who suffer with gout are not on a plant-based diet and they are uh, not drinking enough water. Okay, so uh, when we combine beans uh, with a lot of animal-based food and processed food, it can trigger gouts, but we will not find patients who are long-term on beans intake with no animal products, no alcohol, no caffeine in their diet and suffer gout. Uh, at least I have not come across uh, someone with that problems uh, when they do not have those kind of food in their diet. So gout is quickly addressed and eliminated when we eliminate animal-based food, caffeine, and alcohol, as well as processed food. 
All right, so that is all of the questions that we collected so far. And we also have to close this sections. But if you miss her uh, candy talk, you guys actually can access to Loud Voice, search for Nutrition Podcast. And she has that podcast there, right? Yes, yes. All right, so we really want to thank Candy for her times and all the questions that is very practical, not only for those that ask, but also even for me. Um, here, there's some people that ask if you guys can share or rewatch this video. Actually, yes, you can rewatch this in Facebook, and we actually also post it in our YouTube channel. All right. And before we all close up, there's also a, a talk entitled Post-COVID Care by Dr. Lee on 16 September at 2.30 p.m. I repeat, 16 September, 2.30 p.m. Okay, so if you need more on this, you can just contact the numbers there by the poster. And here's the promotions. Good news, right? You guys heard um, Candy mentions about the that all of the food that is natural is good, but I'm going to say something. Not only is good in health, but it is also yummy in taste. So you're going to try that, all right? So if you really want to taste this good food, you can actually have a voucher in our Anand Health Food, 10 ringgit voucher, if you go to our website, click and buy two courses. And if you buy all of the courses that we have uploaded there, you actually get this voucher as well. And from there, all the things that the whole grants and everything that Candy have mentioned, actually we have it over there. If you have any questions on this, don't worry, we are always ready to answer your questions. And we really want to thank you everyone for listening to us and coming in with us. So we close the sessions.